So I got some questions from, I talked to Adam Parrish over text, and he gave me some suggested questions. Oh, God. He said that you and Jenny play one time a year, which is the mixed pairs. Is that true? Uh, that is true. There, there have been occasional exceptions to that. Um, we, we played in the mixed Swiss recently on that team with Jeff Roman. Oh, but that was in Phoenix. That's right. Yeah, that was unexpected. I didn't have plans to go to Phoenix. And then Jenny found herself unexpectedly free for that weekend and said, hey, do you want to come play on a team with me and Jeff Roman? I said, yep, and got on a plane. And we played in the World Pair Championships in Philly. Mm. But other than that, yeah, we, we play once a year. Uh, there was an effort bef last year, like before Reno, to... I might have the timing wrong on that, but there was a recent effort to to practice online because I, I do play bridge online with some friends. I'm actually playing uh, tonight a, uh, on a team match against Rob Brady. Uh, funny as he brought him up. I wow. think I'm playing with, I haven't I seen think him Adam, in a long time. Adam Kaplan and I are playing against Rob and his partner tonight. Who's live his partner? On, live on Twitch.tv. Uh, Craig Ganser, I think. Oh, okay. Rob yeah. plays a lot with Craig. Yeah. Yeah, Rob, I think Rob has stopped playing Live Bridge, uh, but he creates a ton of content online. He streams on Twitch every day. Really? And he, he posts all of his streams to YouTube. Bridge. They're all like, they're all, yeah, all of his uh, YouTube videos are at least 90 minutes long. And he's playing, you know, uh, tournaments on BBO and talking through his thought process on every single hand. It's really wow. good content. I, I can't recommend it enough. It's way better than my Twitch content, which is usually like me smoking weed and being an idiot and like forgetting how many Trumps there were. Anyway, uh, where were, oh yeah, so Jenny. Jenny and I had had made an effort to uh, practice at some point, and then like she got busy and or like the tournament ended, and so we like didn't pick it back up again. Um, but yeah, we we play about once a year, and so every single year I have to get our notes and like refresh my brain about how we play because she and I play a relay precision system that requires some study. Uh, you know, we have a lot of weird artificial stuff too, like our one diamond opener could be zero diamonds, and like one of a major past two clubs could have no clubs. Like it could be a game force with either minor because we play a major past two diamonds as a limit raise of the major limit raise are better mm. uh, like Drury but by an unpassed hand which lets us stop in two of a major which is good because we open almost all of our 10 counts so being able to stop a level lower than the field is something that we value but yeah we do we play the mixed pairs mm. I actually don't remember Jenny's gonna kill me uh, for saying this but I actually don't remember how we got started playing the mixed pairs like I don't remember with the initial conversation about like, Hey, should we, should we play? Cause I, I just, it's been, it's been a long time and I, I, I do not remember, but yeah, that's, I mean, you know, Jenny's a full-time tournament director. Yeah. And so, you know, we don't, it's, she doesn't, it's not like she has a, a ton of time to play other stuff. And, um, you know, I have, I have kids and a job and stuff. And so it's not like, you know, it's not like I'm playing bridge all the time. That wasn't always true, by the way. There was a period of time where I was uh, teaching bridge. We had a little, like, uh, cadre of, of bridge teachers. My parents. Uh, you were teaching my parents at one point. That's I think right. that was post. That was post. Uh, yeah, post, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, sorry, I interrupted. The, we, there was a, a conglomerate of bridge he's run by uh, a guy named robert todd who you probably yeah, know sure he's been a and, guest on the on the podcast. yeah 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 Re your viewers will know robert and uh, so robert you. was running adventures in bridge and he had a whole collection of uh bridge teachers that would go play in tournaments and give lectures at, at country clubs and and all over the place and that was how i met a lot of the people that are you know that's how i met adam parish it's how i met adam kaplan it's how i met terry um all these people that i've played a ton of bridge with and when I was doing that, uh, I was working full time and traveling a lot to play bridge. And so I would play, we were six handed and I would say, okay, like I have to play halves. Like I can't anchor. 
And I would just schedule which halves I was going to play around any meetings I was going to have or <laughs> any work I needed to do. And so I would just rush back to the hotel room and frantically work during breaks and dinner time and stuff. And wow. play bridge the rest of the time. Yeah, that was rough. Um, <laughs> that sounds I horrible. It, it was rough. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think I owe an awful lot of any current success that I'm enjoying in bridge to, to that because I got to really immerse myself in bridge and it gave yeah. me an opportunity to discuss hands with people who were definitely better bridge players than I was. Mm. And, um, being able to travel around with your expenses paid and play bridge with your friends on, on teams with students who for the most part were, were focused on learning. Yeah. Um, so there was little pressure to win. Mm. Uh, I mean, if you lost all the time, yeah. that would be bad. But one of the things this team had going for it was that nobody had a lot of master points. Mm. And so, you yeah. know, we were frequently in bracket four, bracket five or something. Right. And we, we were, it's not, it's not hard to just keep the ball in the fairway and steamroll bracket five. As I've discovered, it's not that hard to keep the ball in the fairway and steamroll some national events, too. Like, <laughs> a, a lot of people get mad at me for saying this, but I, I feel like in a lot of these events, I didn't do very many things that I think are good. <laughs> like, I did some things that are good. There, there's some things I was proud of. Yeah, There were a couple of things that Jenny... It was one thing in particular that Jenny wrote up for the bulletin that's yeah, like maybe that. one of the best bridge things I've ever done in my life. Uh, but... We'll link to most... that in the show notes. That's the uh, Jack of Diamonds lead, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah the Diamond lead. Um, but for the most part, I feel like if, you, if you're in the right place at the right time, there there's just so many hands. Like If we go and go through all these hands, we're like, oh, yeah, here's the hand where our opponents went for 800 in a part score deal. Mm. And like, here's the hand where our, our opponent with 11 top tricks in four hearts decided to go down one. You know, you're just like, it's, it's, it's not super easy to and and i remember when we were sitting down to play the platinum pairs i was like, okay well, this is going to be a really different experience yeah i mean that's from, a tough from, day of bridge i think uh yeah. well day three was yeah uh but day one was actually felt pretty familiar yeah uh, we cruised into day two we didn't mm. really like i don't feel like we did anything special and then mm. on day two we had a uh, few uh, significant gifts and we just like kind of bid tried to bid and play normally mm. my favorite moment by the way from the whole the whole tournament was uh i believe on day three of the platinum pairs when i sat down against uh versace i don't even remember who his partner was because he was on the other side of the screen but i sit down against him and I've, I've played against him a few times but uh nothing like this has ever happened his partner opens uh i think a heart and it goes uh, pass pass to me, and I have uh, like a five three three two nineteen count, maybe wow. eighteen I, with with five solid spades, like ace king mm -hmm. queen jack ten. Mm -hmm. So I start with a double, and now uh, the guy who opened a heart bids a no trump, and it goes wow. pass. <laughs> yeah, so the guy on my left has a, also has like eighteen nineteen. Yeah, goes a no trump pass, and Versace bids two spades. Whoa. I'm like, okay, pretty sure I could beat this, so I double. And it goes past, and poor Adam. Oh, my God. That's not like, quite in on the joke here. Oh, my uh, God. <laughs> removes this, removes this sure. to 2 no I Trump. Mean, I mean, that's he bids 2 no like... Trump. He's like, I have two places to play. Let's play yeah. 2 no Trump. Like, okay, well, uh... th that's too bad. So I, I pass this 2 no Trump bid, which means that I get to put this hand down as dummy. <laughs> And so Versace makes a lead. He's got like three kibitzers, right? And I face <laughs> his hand. And everyone starts laughing. And, and Versace sticks his head through the screen. And he says, now, he says, no, I'm not saying that I am making two spades. <laughs> says, but if anyone is making two spades, it is me. <laughs> uh, somehow adam still went we still got a good result because adam somehow managed to go plus 120 in two no uh it was fine but we were you know we were obviously two spades was not gonna be <laughs> yeah you just you know partners never pass in that yeah. that's so hard yeah it's it's so frustrating. Hard. of course it's so he's not hard. passing but... <laughs> uh um 
you you you've played a strong diamond. Uh, is there any benefit to playing a strong a strong diamond? Uh, okay, yes, uh, okay. there there is. So here's how it was explained to me, and I I came to believe that this is true. Okay. Uh, so first of all, the most of the benefits of playing any sort of system that has an artificial strong, uh, usually strong club comes from the hands where you don't open a club yeah. right it's the fact that all your other bids are limited and opener's right. range is narrower which is hugely advantageous yeah yeah so of course the strong diamond system has all of those advantages right but when your nebulous opening is one club instead of one diamond those auctions can be it doesn't seem like much because it's just one step, but those auctions can be very accurate. Mm. Uh, we were also, so we, we played like a, a relay structure over this one club. So we would open a club basically saying like, I, I can't open a no Trump. And, I, and also our, one of the major openings, we were five card majors, but they promised an unbalanced hand. Okay. So if you had a balanced hand, even with a five card major, you still had to open a club. Mm. So we would open a club, and the, the only responses to this were one diamond was like 6 to 13, any shape, mm -hmm. and one no trump was 14 plus, any shape. And over both of these, we had shape-showing relays. And so opener could show his exact shape after one club, one diamond. And the auction was super low. It was all organized around keeping the auction really, really, really low on part score deals. So you open a club saying, I have a limited hand. Partner bids a diamond saying, hey, I have a limited hand. And then opener mm -hmm. starts to relay, and you can only really have a few different kinds of hands. You can have like a three-suited hand or both minors or um, a balanced hand or or single-suited, but, but like not really a single-suited minor because we would open two of a minor with that. And, you know, not really both minors because we played the two-no opening as showing both minors. So the auctions were really, really, really accurate. Uh, on on part score deals, so it had that going for it. The one diamond auctions were pretty bad. <laughs> um, the the system. I mean, I I would love to share these notes with you. The, the system was called re recursive diamond. The the idea was that when you opened a diamond, if partner made a positive response, your next bid would would say, "I would have opened this strain a level lower, but my hand was too good." <laughs> Okay, so the whole system was like defined in terms of itself. So let's say when like a, a you open a diamond, partner bids like a heart, which was probably artificial, and then you bid two clubs. Two clubs said I would have opened one club in our system, but my hand was too good for that. And so the one club opener, and then you have the whole same relay structure to mm. shape out your hand. Except now you're in a game force, mm. or like a club, or like a diamond heart, two spades. I would have opened one spade, but my hand was too good. These auctions are not, also, by the way, a, a diamond, a heart, two diamonds says I would have opened a diamond. Never mind the fact that I did, but my hand was too good. This was how you would show a, like a two club kind of hand, mm. like a big two club kind of hand. So and those, those auctions are terrible. Like everybody knows that two club auctions are terrible. And now we're at two diamonds. We still haven't described our hand at all. So those auctions were really, really bad. We were just leaning really hard on the whole idea that you could, uh, gain a lot from these one club auctions so it's different it's it's a lot different from the sam dinkin uh strong diamond system that he plays oh yeah 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 yeah. no that that system uh seems like a lot of good solid thought went into it this was like a bunch of grad student nerds at stanford wanted to do something different for the sake of being different and they wanted to do something vaguely computer sciencey like one of the the core like academic things in computer science is this notion of recursion, which is uh, procedures that are defined in terms of themselves. And mm -hmm. so we wanted to make a bidding system that was defined in terms of itself. You know, where, like mm -hmm. the two spade bid means it's just like the one spade bid, but stronger. You know, things like that. And because uh, we were we were geeks and we were just trying to do stuff, and then we we realized, oh, maybe this is actually playable. This happens a lot. Like Rob Brady invented a system. I swear to God, I have played this system with Rob in actual events where one club was 8 to 10 balanced and one diamond was 11 to 13 balanced and one heart was 14 to 16 balanced and one spade was 17 to 19 balanced, right? It's all the balanced ranges. I think two diamonds was 23 plus. 
And then you would open one no trump with any one suited hand and two no trump with any two suited hand. And then you just hmm. like figure it out from there. All the responses hmm. are transfers. It's really great when you hold balanced hands, right? <sighs> really, really good. <laughs> but uh, it's not a real system, you know? Yeah. This is like something you play in the midnights. And we had great results with it, but mm. it's not a real system. Like, it's, it's the kind of thing where, like, it, it's akin to a cheesy traps in chess. Mm. You know, like, if you're a chess mm. player, there are certain yeah. things where you can... <clears throat> You can trap your opponent if they don't they don't know what's going on, but you try it against a grandmaster and they just destroy you because yeah. the trap itself is not good. Yeah, it's just that it's devastating when you don't know what's coming. Right. Uh, so it's a little bit like that, I think. How many people does Rob Brady get on his his Twitch stream? Uh, you know, I don't know. His streams are often at odd hours, mm. so I often find myself consuming the content after the fact. Um, but do you watch a... it at like two times speed or, uh, <laughs> no, I, I often, so I do a lot of, uh, woodworking and yeah. I have a big TV mounted to the wall in my garage where I have all my wood shop and I'll often have like Rob Brady playing bridge, uh, on the TV. And then I have these like, uh, big you know, ear protector things. So you don't you know, lose your hearing from all the sawing with Bluetooth headphones. And so I'm just like listening to Rob yammer on about bridge for a couple hours while, while I'm cutting wood. Uh, so I don't know, but I mean, his, his chat is overlaid in there and it's, it's a healthy number of people. I mean, it's, it's not thousands. Yeah. There was a time, by the way, I think you'll enjoy this. There was a time when I was playing bridge on Twitch. It was just me. Yeah. Uh, I think I was playing a robot challenge, you know, where another player has played eight boards against Gib and then you play the same eight boards and you compare. Yeah. And so, you know, I would four people are watching me do this maybe yeah. on a good day but then a friend of mine who's someone i've known for almost a decade now uh who at the time i met him was a t teeny tiny bridge uh, a teeny tiny twitch streamer playing video games but has since gr blown up into one of the biggest creators on the platform decided when he, he was ending his stream he noticed that i was online and he hosted my channel which effectively sends his entire viewership dire directly to me yeah into my chat and so i get a little notification on my screen that says this guy is now hosting your channel with twenty four thousand viewers wow and so twenty four thousand people descend on me playing cards and talking about cards and it was just you know, just pandemonium none of them is a bridge player of course yeah yeah, yeah. so you know i just had to stop playing bridge for an hour and start answering their questions. This was at a time when I was working at Twitch. And yeah. so, uh, you know, viewers of a big Twitch stream have a lot of questions about the inner workings of Twitch. Like, why'd you ban right, this person? Right, or how right, does this right, work? Right, or whatever. Right, and so right, right. They just wanted to beat my ear about, <laughs> about uh, Twitch and, and then nobody cared about bridge. <laughs> it was a wild moment. Somewhere I have uh, that video saved. Uh, yeah. You, that we'd I'd love to have that if you can if you yeah can I'll, I'll can find it, it with the put the, the time show notes. Um, the, I I tuned into one of your Twitch like saved things and it seemed like you were playing with Terry. It was the most recent one, but it seemed okay. like everybody at the table was talking. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we we just have a um, like a Zoom call open on the side. Just so so you're chat. not like I thought on Twitch, like people would talk about like what they were doing, what they were thinking. So it's not that. Well, they're not stream. The other three people aren't streaming. I'm the only one on Twitch. They're just playing bridge. So, so we just God. get into a Zoom call and I open it up on my screen, which is why you can hear it. Uh, I'm not showing their faces or anything. I mean, I could, right. I suppose, but right. Uh, I mean, yeah. But you're not, it's not like you're talking through what you're thinking because they would hear you. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, no. Occasionally, I will mute myself in the call yeah. if I want to talk about the hand. But okay. for the most part, the, you know, the Twitch streams that I do are, are just like four friends playing bridge and like having a good time. And sometimes people enjoy observing that phenomenon. Right. Uh, whereas, you know, people like Gavin streams on Twitch sometimes or, or YouTube and, and, and Rob Brady and some other people, but they'll, uh, they're often doing it very like solo. Mm. Uh, 
and so their then their content is a lot more educational in mm. nature right like here's how we think about this hand or here's why you should bid this and not that and mm. mostly this is just you know me and some friends of mine being clowns got it i don't know what we're doing tonight actually we're we're rob and i are both going to be streaming tonight playing with adam and i assume craig but i i'm not sure about that um and i asked rob if i should be streaming and he said yeah we both should but i don't know if that means that we're not going to be in a call uh and and chatting because you know if he's talking through his thought process obviously yeah i shouldn't hear that yeah uh, i'm not sure. wait are you playing on bridge base yeah and you're playing i, I, like I assume a... so actually uh I would assume you play yeah. view graph deals or something like that, or usually, I mean, that's, well, that's what I do with, uh, Terry and, and, and people when we play, we, we just, we either play random view graph deals or we'll play through like the Spingold finals or something. Sometimes the random view graph deals are, uh, are weird. Like you get weird results or sometimes the, the database is buggy. Um, but the, the results from the, the actual view graph events are pretty good. Hmm. You say, oh, look, I, I played this hand better than Bobby Levin. Oh, <laughs> Which almost nice. inevitably I... means uh, Bobby took fewer tricks than I did because Bobby was, you know, taking a higher percentage line of play. <laughs> and I'm I'm the, the rueful rabbit in these scenarios always. I look forward to, like, playing a view graph match and then, like, having a deal be one that I played already. I think it's happened once. Uh, not like the oh. whole match, but like where, where something was sprinkled in that I had. Uh, oh, where played. you find yourself, you, you're the, your own view graph. Yeah. Yeah, well. yeah. I don't think I've ever, that's not true. I've, I've been on view graph. Well, I, I've played in the trials a couple of times and I know some of those matches were view graph, but there was also, there was a view graph table when Jenny and I were in the finals of the world pairs and it was not my finest moment either. <laughs> Uh, it's possible that Jenny told this story, I think, on the same podcast, but it was the <laughs> where we had some sort of mix-up disaster. Jenny finds herself going down many, many, many tricks. And it's really, like, she's really trying to keep it together, but she's on view graph, right? And it's just, it's just gone down a bunch. And in a, in a very misguided attempt to lighten the mood, I think I stuck my head <laughs> through the screen and said, did we make it? <laughs> And, and I think she may have actually started to cry. Ah. Um, really did not read the room uh, <laughs> in that moment. Not my finest moment. <laughs> that was one of the things you said to me and in, uh, in your email was uh, balancing com being competitive and, and also like you ha like to have a good time at the table. Oh, yeah. Jenny and... I Everyone always remarks on how much fun Jenny and I are having. Like they'll see us from across the room, and everyone's always laughing. Uh, and I think people have started to realize, like from the consistency of our results, that we have somehow managed to engineer a situation where we're <laughs> handing people zeros, and they're laughing. And, Thanks for playing with us. This was such a delight. Like, yeah, it was, wasn't it? For us too. Uh, but yeah, we have a we have a great time. It's a tough balance because uh, I see a lot of people who play bridge. They're very serious about it, um, and they have no tolerance for any anything that they don't that they think is wrong. Their partner does something. Their partner played the six of hearts instead of the five, and you know for the next thirty minutes, it's all they're going to gripe about or or whatever. And that that I've never understood why bridge turns otherwise reasonable people into <laughs> mon monsters I mean, I've, we've all seen bridge partners yeah, just start I've, berating I've been, to i've been that person uh more than once <laughs> probably to you uh, <laughs> i don't i don't know i i don't know i think uh, i remember <laughs> a hand i think from the imp pairs actually i remember a hand very clearly where you got you received a penalty double in three spades. You were about to declare three spades doubled. Yeah. But the partner of the doubler pulled it. And I remember in my head thinking, oh, thank oh, God. God. Oh, no. And then it came back around to you. And I think you weren't in on the joke. And you were like, oh, this must not have been a penalty double. Because his partner pulled it. And so you bid four spades, which then got ripped and went for like 1,400 or something. And uh, you... <laughs> You weren't mad at me about it, but but you you were pretty upset. 
<laughs> I remember from Philadelphia, there was a hand where I think you were on lead against three. No. And you had like ace fifth of clubs okay. and you didn't lead a club. Oh. And I remember being so mad at you about that. Club, club would have worked out. Huh? And Gavin, Gavin somehow was there and yeah, it wasn't my finest hour. Like, honestly, like I'm not the best technical player, but the, the one of the advantages that I can have at the bridge table is like being a good partner and having like partnership harmony. Yeah. And that's something that it, I, in, in many on. ways, I think that's a more valuable skill. Like, this is something I've never understood. Like what you need at the bridge table is you need your, you need to, you know, get yourself together, obviously, but you need your partner to be at their best. Mm. And so when something bad happens, you know, unless it's a misunderstanding that needs clearing up because it might happen again, you know, your job as a bridge partner is to do whatever you need to do to help your partner get over it. Yeah, uh, that's true. Steve and Bobby talk about this all the time. It's something they're especially good at. Um, mm. They, when they have a bad result, sometimes they'll take a quick break, go out in the hallway and say, you know, they, they, they approach the game with, with utter contempt for their opponents, right? <laughs> they're like, they just sit down. It doesn't matter if their opponents are like world champ, multiple time world champions. They're just like, these guys mm. are idiots. Like they could barely mm. follow suit. Mm. Let's just put them in the dirt, you know? Mm. And, and that's the, so they give themselves a little pep talk and come right back in uh, and usually usually get it done. And that's something that's really, really nice about uh, playing with Jenny is that we're having such a good time all the time that our bad results, you know, they, they're forgotten pretty quickly. Sometimes Jenny needs to vent, but, but it's never like, it's never mean. It's just like, because if she doesn't vent, then there's she's like mm, you know it's on the inside and then it festers you don't want that either mm. uh, but you know like any any good relationship we have an understanding that like if she's venting it's not it's not because she thinks i'm stupid it's just because she needs to like purge these thoughts from her system and then we'll go on and you know beat up on these clowns in the next round and it doesn't matter and it seems to be working were you and adam surprised like, was there at any point during your run to third place in the Platinum Pairs where you're like, kind of like, can you believe we're doing this? Or like, did you say that to each other afterwards? Like, oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, make our goal when we when we sat down on day one, our goal was to make day three. Yeah. Right. Uh, Adam. I thought that Adam was in the same boat I was, but Adam actually made the last day of the Risinger in Phoenix. Um, it was not last. Uh, our goal was to make day three and then we made day three in like striking distance. And I think what I, what we both took away from that was we did really well and day two wasn't nearly as tough as either we expected or remembered from yeah. other events. Uh, yeah. I've never played in the platinum pairs before, but I've been in the blue ribbon pairs and I know those aren't the same event, but yeah, yeah. I remember the day two of the blue ribbon <clears throat> pairs being quite tough. And mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't feel like the, the, I didn't feel like we encountered anything in the platinum pairs where I was like, wow, like that was some world-class bridge. Mm. I, I really don't. Um, even, even on the third day, I mean, people did well, yeah. um, but people made plenty of mistakes. And, and actually uh, it was funny that in our final round, uh, so I, I was doing actually quite a poor job of estimating our results yeah, um, because I thought that we had had quite a weak uh, sixth session. And we we went into the final round. And I was like, yeah, I feel like we're just kind of nowhere. We're in the middle. Like we're nowhere. And um, I just decided that you know I want to come top ten in this event. Where were so you was, in the uh, at the at the break uh, between the fifth and sixth session? Where were you then? I don't know. Let me look that up. That's fr oh, that was Friday. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's Friday. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Sunday. Uh, leaderboards, 10 a.m. We were fourth. And you must have. You must have taken that in. It's. I mean, like you must have been like. Yeah. No. I mean, being fourth, like it was wild. We're like, how can we be in striking distance of this event? This is crazy. Like the yeah. The top of this leaderboard is like a who's who of bridge. Uh, I see that that Johnny and Vince were leading after five sessions too. 
they held on. Uh, but I really felt like our sixth ses- set had not been particularly good, and so we yeah. we we and I'm like, yeah, I feel like you know, like hasn't gone real well, and like I really want to be top ten in this event, like that would be amazing. Yeah. And yeah. So we sit down our last hand, uh, last round, and I had some like four two four three five count. Partner opens a heart and it goes pass pass. Right, I I pass this because yeah, yeah, you know whatever, and it, yeah. I don't have a response, and then now. Lefty balances a spade. Partner bids two hearts. And it goes double pass two no. And this passes back to me. And I'm just like, you know what? I don't think they can make two no Trump. I don't know if they can make two no Trump. But I just feel like like I need a thing here. They're red. And I want 200. Who you are you know, like I want to be I want to be top 10. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. What I found out later was that the pair we were playing against was... Uh, the the bottom qualifier for day three, okay. and they had squeaked into day three because on day two Adam revoked against them, and <laughs> so so anyway, so we were having this like sort of pseudo revenge match. I actually didn't yeah. remember that this was the okay. same here. Adam told me this later. Yeah, so I doubled this, and uh, I do remember that the tray was over on the other side for a really long time, and the guy who had bid two no Trump at some point leans over to me and says, "Does your double call for a heart lead?" I said, no, my double says I don't think I'm going to be top 10 in this event if I don't get 200 on this board. So I, I just, I, you're doubled in two no. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. And uh, so anyway, eventually we get 500 against two no, which is wild on this part score deal. And with this board, it took like 10 minutes to, to, deal, to deal with. And most of the other pairs in the room were done. Right. Yeah. Um, which is wild because there are so many notoriously slow pairs in this field like the the place pace of play on day three is very very slow yeah. for the field to be done while we're still dealing with board one is actually a lot of unauthorized information to me right right, right? Sure. like what do i now know about the second hand yeah. it's got to be nothing right because we're all right. playing the same hands at the same time it's played yeah, barometer yeah, yeah. style yeah, 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 there's yeah. no leaderboard but we're playing simultaneously yeah so the second board comes up and righty over opens a heart and I have a very normal one no trump over call and I overcall a no trump and it goes penalty double. <laughs> that doesn't Jeez. sound like a normal <laughs> I'm like, what? fast board. What is happening here? Like the whole room is like, we're just, it's just empty. It's just like us and Joel Wooldridge are the only people still left in the room, right? A notoriously slow. slow <laughs> like, okay. Okay. So uh anyway, Parter uh redoubles showing a single suited hand he wants to run it goes pass i bid two clubs like i'm supposed to and it goes double and all passes so i'm declaring two clubs doubled and it's like cold i'm just like plus 180 <laughs> this is our last round and i'm wow. like oh it, and wow. i walk out of the, i walk That's out of the amazing. room like last i think we did it like i think wow. i think we had we got like two tops on the last two boards oh like this God. is amazing i think we've probably like this will put us in like in the top 10 and then like I walk out and I look at the leaderboard and uh, where the thing with one round to go and we're oh, fifth, God. Oh, and it's okay. close. Like we're less than a we're less than a board behind I'm first. Yeah, and wow. and we're in fifth. And I'm like, oh my god! Just like I was, I was like, oh, oh my gosh. god! Like what just happened? Because this, you know, this was like a hail mary last round. Oh my that, god! That I did largely because I was misestimating. <laughs> So, I mean, like, if I knew I was, if you told me I was fifth, oh there's, no, there's no world in which I'm doubling two no Trump. On so now I'm, now I'm sweating and now everyone, so we walk out there. Of course, everyone has been out for five minutes and yeah. we walk out and everyone's like, how was your last round? How was your last round? I was like, well, we were plus 500, plus 180. And everyone's like, holy shit. Like, those are some results. And now, like, you know, Vince and Johnny are, are like, oh, no, like, they're sweating. Like, they had a good last round, but not that good. And this, it wasn't quite enough. There were only three match points between third and first. Wow. Uh, and there was, I mean, I'm sure you saw, there were two one hundredths of a match point between first and second. Wow. Like what, you know, that's like one trick on day one worth of carryover. Wow. Uh, between first and second. Wow. But yeah, what a while. So, you know, estimating. <laughs> what do you think I, your I, two I, final I think... round percentages were like uh, your two last day platinum percentages were oh i well since i have this stuff up i can yeah, just tell sure. you uh because i do not remember i just oh, acbl live 
when you go back, it returns you to day one, uh, or, or the first page, rather. Let me open these in new tabs. Okay, so the recap, this is session five. Uh, Jesus, you thought you fucking had oh, a chance to win the damn had, thing. We had a 56. I mean, you did. Session, you were close. We had a 56 in session five and a 57 and a half in wow. session six. Man. That's impressive. And, and the that second that didn't play, win. Yeah. And by the way, you know, when, when, I, when I was thinking about that, I mean, it was something that I think it was Zach Grosak said to me. I because I, I told him we had these these games or what it said on the on the thing and he's like that might do it he's like it's the plat it's day three the platinum pairs no one's having a sixty yeah right like you're not supposed to like everyone's supposed to know yeah. what they're doing the pair that came second Ola Rimstead and Irene had a sixty eight to come two one hundredths of a match point from winning wow right yeah wow I gotta stop saying wow but <laughs> what else can you say sixty eight is just like it's really something. So you indirectly are responsible for Double Dummy. Did you know that? I did not. Uh, we were in Memphis, played the plat. Uh, sorry, played the uh, not the platinum pairs, the imp pairs. Yeah. And one of the nights there was a brainstorming session about how do we get more young people interested in learning bridge. I was, was we were at dinner with Paul Street. Was it that? Did it? No, no. We went to some a, dinner. With it was a brainstorming session, and there was a free dinner. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, like the junior. Mm -hmm. And you invited me to it. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know about it. You invited me, and that was like the beginning of what would become. Like I remember being at that dinner, and they're talking about like how do we get more young people interested in learning bridge? Oh wow! And like the light bulb went off, not for a film necessarily. And then also one of the, I guess it was the impairs between rounds. We went back to your room with your roommate was Adam Kaplan mm -hmm. and Adam was like famous from bridge winners already, even though he was 16. And that's how I met Adam Kaplan. And what I liked about Adam Kaplan, in spite of your being like 20 years older than him, he was making fun of you for the way that you were thinking about some of the deals that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And Adam was like the reason that we made the film about him and that team. So. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. I really enjoy, I used to room with Adam at nationals a lot. <laughs> uh, I don't really know how that happened. You, you would think like it'd be the sort of thing. Cause he was Trav, he was playing bridge full time as a, as a teenager. And it's not like, you know, I, I'm friends with his parents and so they trust me or anything like that. It was just like, you know, we, we had this mutual relationship with Robert Todd and we just ended up rooming together all the time. I think it's because despite being, you know, 20 years older than him, I, I think we are, we were mentally about the same. I remember, I think that might have been the night where we accidentally ordered a second pizza. And so we had this extra pizza that we didn't want. And so he and I had a contest to see like who could throw the most pepperoni into one of those standing halogen torch lamps. It was like, the, this is a stupid, right? I mean, I was like, what? In, this is, I was like 30 something throwing pepperonis at a lamp with a teenager. Yeah. We were having a good time. He and I once, uh, not in Memphis, but maybe it was Louisville. We, we were playing together and not in any national stuff. We were just playing bridge. And we, we decided to run an experiment to see if we could physically play four sessions a day for 10 days. <laughs> uh, this was back when there were midnights and the games were at 9 and 1 and 7.30. This is a national so, or regional? Regional. Just regional stuff. Okay. We weren't we weren't planning anything like big and serious, and so yeah. we were trying desperately to do this. And we were so, we were so tired. We made it about six days uh, before we we called it off. But one of my absolute this is How one of my you absolute call it off after six days. You got one day left. No, this was at nationals. There were ten days. Oh, oh, oh. We were. It was. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. This was. Oh. This wasn't Gatlinburg. I mean, this was like we we were we were delirious. And one of my favorite memories from any bridge tournament was in that last day, we were playing the, like a morning, 
compact KO. You know, one of these things that goes like across <laughs> two days. And Adam was like, he was so tired. He's like drifting in and out of consciousness while he's declaring, he's like declaring some part score. And there was some point around trick seven or eight where he detaches a card from his hand, okay, faces it, and then lays his head down on the table like he's about to go to sleep. And, and with his last ounce of strength says out loud, West is squeezed making in the majors making three or something like that. Like he just claimed on a squeeze as he drifts off to sleep. I'm just like, who is this kid? Insane. That that round also is one of the this is just just a funny anecdote. It's one of the wildest things I've ever seen at a bridge table. Before the session started, it's like eight fifty five. Adam and I are sitting there with one of our opponents, which was like an elderly woman. And we're like, you know, her, her partner's not there yet. We're just chatting. And a kibitzer is walking through the ballroom holding a chair above her head. Yeah. So, you know, things are packed close together. Yeah. And as this kibitzer gets close to our table, she trips over oh, like a, a, a poorly gaffered, you know, cable right. or something. And brings this chair down oh, on this old woman's head. Oh, my God. Okay, with That's full not, force. Oh my god! Yeah, crack. Oh okay, my. knocks the lady on. The lady's knocked unconscious. I mean, she could have killed her. Yes, lady. So this lady is knocked out, pitches forward, and and you know, her head hits the table, which which snaps her too. So she she slams into the table, sits back up, it throws her hand up, and yells, "Director, please." <laughs> In like one swift motion, <laughs> and so I think it was, it was Saul Weinstein shows up. He's annoyed that he's been called. Right, the game hasn't started yet. Yeah, it's like what what's going on? He comes over and he's like, "Oh my god!" Because she's like she's got a head. She's like bleeding oh my god. Jesus. down her head, and he's like, "Oh my god!" Like I'm gonna, I'll be right back. I'm gonna get the thing. And she says, "No, no, no. I I want a player like a player memo, like a recorder form or something." He's like, and he says, I will never forget. He says, ma'am, you are bleeding from your head. I'm, I'm getting the EMTs. So he goes and gets the, you know, they have people on, on call for this sort of yeah. thing. So the, the like emergency people show up and she's insisting that she wants, she says to the, the medics, she's like, I, I want to handle this through the ACBL. And they're like, okay, what's the ACBL? Like, these are, these are, they don't know what's, what an ACBL is. They, they, she's like, you have a head wound. <laughs> and she's like, no. And so she refuses medical advice. So they what? just like cl- clean her up as best they can, like you know. And and we played bridge, <laughs> like we just sat there and played our whatever it was, our two boards. I think this was like a morning side pairs, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. We just played bridge. Her partner showed up, and uh, we just played bridge. It was fine. I mean, haven't you ever been in a ballroom full of people when someone is there with one of those like oxygen portable oxygen tanks and like. Have you been in one where like it starts to malfunction and like the alarm starts going no, off? No. And I have. And in a big ballroom full of people, there's like this <laughs> loud piercing alarm because someone's oxygen tank is failing and no one does anything, right? No one even looks to see if there's a problem. Everyone's just like small club please. And you know, and inevitably like the guy's like, Oh, it's embarrassing, it goes and fiddles with a knob on it and the alarm stops and it's fine and everyone just carries on. <laughs> Bridge is serious business. Do you do you ever hold over like for example, Robert Todd, your you know, got got you into Bridge. You ever hold over the fact that Robert hasn't won a national event over like you ever give him Oh, that's anybody? that would be petty even for me. <laughs> No, 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 no. He no. never give anybody like, uh, like, like. Uh, I played with Walt Schaefer. You know Walt Schaefer. He he has yeah. a game on BBO, the Schaefer game, which was like uh-huh. a staple of COVID. Yeah. And I played with him one time. He's been on the podcast, and he we played. He wanted to play count and trumps, and I said, "Okay." I was, I said, I didn't I didn't even know that that was that anybody played that. And he said, he said, ask Rick Roder, Counting Trumps has won 
Three more national events <laughs> than Rotor. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <sighs> no, no, I'm not. I would <laughs> hold the video over Robert Todd. I mean, Robert. Uh, no, Robert. I don't have a problem with Robert. I, he, I owe. I, I mean, I owe Robert a great debt. Yeah. You know, I mean, he gave me these opportunities to play, like a hundred plus days of bridge a mm. year for free mm. in really cool places mm. uh, with people I like while I was holding down a full-time job. There's no way I would be able to sit down in the platinum pairs. I mean, I, I wouldn't have met Adam Parrish. Like I don't know these people, but like, I wouldn't be able to function mm. in any sort of high level bridge environment without, my exposure to that either from just from the raw experience or the people I met mm. or, you know, all the hands I discussed with Adam Kaplan, like, there's just no way. But I, I think part of the reason I'm asking this is like winning a national event. Like I, I unexpectedly, I wasn't expecting to win the event that I won, but like, it's pretty sweet, you know, yeah, like, it's... you know, like it's, you should you should try winning two more. It's still it's pretty good. <laughs> it's good, um, <clears throat> yeah, especially it was, like I had come close a number of times. Like I like I Adam won. Kaplan hasn't won a national event, for example. And That's true. Won, yeah, he. Uh, I would never hold that over him, but he pointed that out a number of times <laughs> in in New Orleans. Uh, <laughs> because I think not because he's like. Uh, it's not not like a, a jealousy thing or like you know I'm such a better bridge player than you blah 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 because you know he he doesn't play the mixed pairs right like if he's mm. if he's playing national stuff like he's playing the Vanderbilt or something. Mm. but it's not that I think it's that he's worried that he's going to hit ten thousand master points yeah. and <laughs> and become a platinum life master yeah. which I think someone like Adam views as sort of a booby prize. <laughs> totally right yeah, like, like he's going to be like those forty ers that drop out of the ACBO. <laughs> So they can stop tracking his points. He's going to get like 9,998 points. He's just going to like cancel his membership. <laughs> I mean, I thought that I was going to be running up against that. I mean, not that I have that many. I mean, I have 4,100, but like I, I was like, when am I ever going to win one of the, you know, these, these events? It was your time. But I did. Yeah, well done. Um, how many master points do you have? Uh, forty-eight. It was just just shy of five thousand. Mm. So we're pretty. Yeah, close. I'm not exactly sure, but I know that that New Orleans didn't put me over five thousand. Mm. I just don't. I don't play that much bridge like I, anymore. Like when I was when I was playing with with Robert's crew, you know, we would accumulate a uh, hundred points a week, mm. pretty regularly, mm. and and so it was it was easy to win several hundred points a year just grinding them out at, from regional to regional, or we would go to sectional sometimes, you know, and win like 30 silver points at the, you know, community center in East Jesus Nowhere, Colorado. But, you know, really I play in the spring nationals and, uh, you know, my friends and I try to get to the New Year's uh, regional when we can. Uh, that's, that's been regular. Uh, there was a time when Max and I, Max Ashbacher and I were going to the Honolulu regional every year, uh, which was really fun, but that tournament is, is teeny tiny. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't get to, I don't get to play that much anymore. If I, you know, if I won the lottery and retired, I would play more, but life is, uh, continues to get in the way. How old is your is your uh, oldest? She was the one that kind of got in Isabel, right? She kind of got into yeah. It. Isabel is eighteen. Now. Wow. Yeah, she's just about to graduate from high school. Wow. I actually mentioned you to a friend. I ran into a friend at the grocery store the other day, and I mentioned I don't know how it came up, but I mentioned you to her, and she knew you through uh, through school through St. Anne's, I think. She knew. Oh, of, oh. She knew of you. Yeah. But not. I, I've played with the mother of a Saint Anne's student in like the Charlottesville Club Pro Am recently. Mm, mm. Uh, no, not she wouldn't. Not, no, she wouldn't have been yeah. that woman. I, I forget how it came up and how I came to you. But uh... yeah, I'm a local celebrity. But yeah, it's true. I, I did try to teach Isabel Bridge when when she was really little, and uh, I, I was I was amazed 
at the time at how not only how well she picked it up but how easily she invented concepts on her own and at the time you know i was a proud dad i was just like oh my kid's a genius but <clears throat> and she is but i reflected on it more over time and i think it has a lot more to do with the fact that when you try to teach someone who is a beginner at bridge not a novice right not someone who's never played yeah. but someone who's a beginner they come in with sometimes years of baggage mm. stuff they think they know yeah and it's very 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 tough to even figure out what that is much less get them to unlearn it whereas when i had isabel isabel never played bridge before and so we were able to discuss bidding, especially since it was just the two of us. We only talked about bidding, really. Uh, we were able to talk about bidding in a very theoretical way. And so she approached bidding problems. It's just like, okay, you know, how many points do I have? What level are we getting to? Do we have a major suit fit? Yes, no, maybe. That sort of thing. And with just that framework and not much else, other than, you know, stamen transfers and like knowing that one no Trump is 15 to 17. She independently invented Lebensol over reverses. Just all on her own. And, you know, because we had a hand where I reversed. <clears throat> and, you know, I, was, I, I would always ask her every time I bid, like, you know, what's, what's my point? We called it a box. I think the bridge world had this idea of the box where you have a top and a bottom for your thing and it, and it should shrink every time you bid and you add yours to the other thing. And, and you know, she, she's like, oh, you know, like 16 to 21. And then it occurred to her that, like, you can't... There are some hands that she could have where you want to bid three of a minor to play, and there are some hands where you could have, like, a slam in a minor, and, like, you, there's no room, right? There's no room for both of those things. You can't bid three clubs to play and three clubs as a slam try. This just doesn't make sense. And so she's like, this is broken. She's like, we maybe we need to use, you know, to no Trump to, like, say that I have the other one or something like that. It just occurred. She was, like, six years old. Wow. And I was like, you thought you were shit. taking her to the <laughs> right. I was like, oh my god! Like you know, you're you're the best bridge player ever. And, and it, you know, I mean, she's a very very smart kid. And yeah. but and not to take anything away from 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 any of that, but I think that she she just wasn't encumbered by any of this nonsense. Like you know, we've all seen. I think there's some. I remember some hand where I watched students. This is when I was working with Robert. I think I watched students bid like two no Trump, three no Trump. Okay. And the three no Trump bidder puts down like a four, two, three, four, six count. And we asked like, why didn't you bid stamen? And she says, well, you need eight points to bid stamen. Uh, right. And you yeah. can see like, it's funny, yeah. but you can, you, it's easy to see where that confusion comes from. And it's mm -hmm. made me think a lot about how we teach bridge. You know, we teach it, especially in books and stuff, and a lot of educational materials is like this grab bag of, of detailed knowledge and nowhere, there's no framework around it where you understand what the goal of the auction is, what you're mm -hmm. trying to accomplish. Um, because nobody, you know, no expert is bidding two, no, three, no with these hands. And well, why is that? It was because they understand like, oh, I have my points to the thing. I'm bidding a game which game we could still have a major suit for it's a simple it's completely automatic but so many beginners you see the their partner will open a diamond and they'll pick up their hand they'll be like okay what do i do with this hand is this one heart response what does that show oh yeah okay no i don't have that okay is this one spade response what does that show? no no i don't have that this is one you know and they're just like going through the bids one at a time and if at any point during that process they get mixed up they end up doing something insane Right, like something that's just from outer space, and you're like, well, you know, how did this happen? And you try to like, what was the thought process so that I can repair the thought process? But that's that the problem is really that there wasn't a thought process. The problem is that they're just like trying to figure. I, I've likened it to uh, like if you know your buddy's phone number and you want his address, and all you have is a phone book, and so you just start like looking through the phone book one entry at a time. That's really what they're doing, and. It's, it's it's very inefficient <laughs> and very frustrating and very error prone. Oh my god! I mean, how often have you seen a beginner like their partner opens a a, a heart 
and they don't respond to no Trump because their hand doesn't look balanced. You know, they're like, I have, I have seven clubs. I can't bet on no Trump. Right? And they don't, like, uh, you know, they're just like, you can see where, you kind of see what the idea is. But I, you know, you have to, you have to, it's something you have to deprogram them. Like they were in a cult. You got to get them back to a blank slate and just fill their head with good ideas again. And it's very difficult. I don't know that I ever had much success with it. I saw this phone be- number analogy in your well, and I didn't understand what you were saying with it. So oh, it's yeah. very funny when I actually realize what you're talking about. Yeah, I, re- I really do think that's how they approach it. Uh, and, and also it's it's tough because beginners like if you're trying to teach a beginner uh it, they have all these these years they they don't want to start over right they don't want to go back to basics they're they want they they're like hey can you give a lecture on new minor forcing because i always mess that up yeah right yeah, yeah. and like they, they're right they probably do frequently mess up new minor forcing and they think like if someone will just please for once teach me new minor forcing properly i'll understand it and, and get it right and mm. and you can't you just, they don't want to hear because you know they're usually paying money for a bridge <laughs> teacher they don't want to hear yeah that's not what you need <laughs> what you need is to unlearn everything you've learned for the last 10 years and we're going to start with like what's a trick <laughs> right they don't want to hear that uh they want they want to like uh tweak this they're like oh i, I don't understand garbage statement. I believe that you don't understand garbage stamen, but like I don't think that me explaining garbage statement is going to repair your bridge game. Uh, and I feel there's a lot of tension there. Like as a teacher, you want to give your students what they are asking. Well, sorry, as a business person, you want to yeah. give them what they're asking for because yeah. this is you know it's your livelihood. But then also you realize like these people genuinely want to get good at bridge, yeah. and it's very frustrating to not know what's going on. And I even if you think that you know what they need. They they don't want to hear that, so I'm not really sure what can be done. I do wish that there were better educational materials for absolute novices, like the way that I taught Isabel. I've never seen written down anywhere. This like f- just first principles, like what's the level, what's the strain. Don't worry about any conventions, and in many ways. The convention, the need for the conventions reveals itself. Mm. If you understand how many high card points do we need, do we have a major suit fit, the need for stamen will present itself. Mm. Mm. And you'll say, oh, we, we need a way to find this. And then you can introduce, and we have a gadget for this. But you've already, you've already grasped the need for such a gadget. It's not some weird artificial, oh, God, I have to memorize what now? Okay, I'll write this down. Like how everybody felt in math class in high school. Okay, I'll write down this formula and just like pray I understand it later. That's how almost everyone approaches math if they're not already a math nerd. I was very much the opposite of that. I was really into, I'm sure this will shock you, but I was really into math in school. And, um, <laughs> but I, I always really wanted to understand what was actually going on underneath everything. And so I didn't worry, I never worried about memorizing things. And I remember once uh, preparing, I was sitting outside getting ready to take whatever the AP calculus test. And one of my peers came over to me and said, in panic, he's like, I can't remember the formula for whatever it was, this, this integral, this thing, this volume of, I don't know. What is it? And I said, I don't know. He's like, what do you mean you don't know? You're good at this. I was like, I don't know. Like, this is not how I think about it. If I need Mm. that, I will derive it from scratch because Mm. I know how it works. Like these things aren't mysteries to me to be memorized. Mm. I understood the underlying principle. Mm. So if I have to solve the problem, I will solve the problem. And I, you know, I could, I felt like smoke was coming out of his ears. He just couldn't, he couldn't understand because he'd been approaching calculus as this thing. You just have have to memorize. Oh my God, I've never memorized so much stuff in my life. Mm. Bridge is the same way. I think for many players. Which is too bad, because as you know, it's a really beautiful, rich, complex universe that you can explore. Um, And I feel like so many people are kind of like tapping on the glass from the outside. Because they they just, they don't have the, the right thought process to penetrate into this universe and really see why it's so pretty. 
It makes me like listening to you talk about the math makes me realize how you could have written this book that uh, that you got the Academy. It's, I don't think it's technically an Academy Award. Isn't isn't there a different nomenclature? It, it for is. It? It, it, yeah, you're you're right. There is a distinction, but you've got it. You've got it backwards. It is an Academy Award. It's not an Oscar. Uh, the Oscar is the statue. Ah, uh, okay. So when people are like, I want an Oscar, what they mean is, like, they have a stat, the physical statue. The Academy Award is the actual accolade. Uh, the Oscar is just the physical thing. And they don't give the Oscars to the people who win the, the science, the technical Academy Awards. I don't know why. I feel like, you know, we would like them just as much as, you know, Kate Winslet or whoever. But I, toy, I, I, I toy with the idea sometimes of, like, buying an old one. Because you can find them on eBay, yeah, right? Like some sure, dude won sure. best sound design in 1954, and he needs the 500 bucks or whatever. Uh, but I, I never have. It seems a little self indulgent. All right, let's let's finish it off with this. Will you tell the story of finding out how you got nominated for uh, this? Jenny suggested that that for the Academy Award. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so so in in grad school, I wrote this book with a, a co-author, and I wrote this book that was originally intended just as a support mechanism for a class that our mutual advisor was teaching. He was frustrated that people had to spend so much time building the under like this big computer system just to experiment with some simple things that they never really got to do anything cool. And so he said, what if we gave them that at the beginning and just said, build on top of this? And we'll, we'll give them a big computer system that they can extend for their own research. And we will describe all of the details of how the code is written and all the math behind it in the same document. It's this, this technique where you combine code and writing into a single document and can publish it as a book. Called, uh, for, those, for anyone listening who knows, it's called literate programming. So we did this to support the class, and we said, oh, you know, this we could publish this. This would be cool. So we got a, a publisher that was interested, and we we spent years working on it. And eventually, turned it into a book. Because the thing that you need to support a class doesn't need to be fully fleshed out, but a book needs to be, you know, a book it needs to be good. So we did this, and what happened was, and we didn't know that this was happening, but what happened was. This book that described all of the mathematics and computer science details of how to make really photorealistic pictures with computers, how to really like simulate all the physics of light transport in the scene so that the pictures that come out of computers look good, you know, uh, had it, it had all kind of existed in various fragmented pieces across the research space, but never quite in one place all in all together. So when we published this book, the special effects industry sort of took it in and said, Oh, we should do this. Like now we get it. Like it's all in one place. And, and at the same time, all of the students across the country who were now being educated with this resource were coming out of school with a much deeper understanding mm. of how this is working. So then they start to enter the film special effects industry and they would demand to do it the way that we had done it. Mm. And, but we didn't know any of this was going on. I mean, the, the film industry is notoriously tight-lipped about how they do stuff. So the Scientific and Technical Academy Awards are weird. People nominate themselves. And then the Academy says, okay, we hear that you did a cool thing. Uh, we will create a category around that, and we will seek out other nominees in this category. And so... Some like in 2013, someone came around and nominated themselves for some photorealistic rendering something, something. Mm. And the academy said, Okay, let's talk to a bunch of people. And they went and talked to a bunch of people and said, What do you guys do? And they said, Oh, we just do what Greg and Matt said in the book. Okay, what do you guys do? Well, we just do what Greg and Matt. And so the, the head of the committee, who was the, the chief technical officer of a company called Weta Digital. If you, if you know anything about this, they did all the special effects for like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and mm -hmm. they're in New Zealand. He's like, well, why aren't we talking to those guys? <laughs> like, why aren't they nominated? And so they called us up and they said, hey, uh, you know, we want you to be considered as part of this category. <laughs> like, what? Like, we don't work in films. And they said, yeah, but everyone who works in films just uses your thing now. Wow. I said, really? 
<laughs> that's cool. Like, because we just made a textbook for like graduate students in computer graphics who wanted to understand stuff better. And so uh, we said, okay, that's wild. And then uh, a couple months later, they said, yeah, we threw you into this category and decided that everyone in this category is just doing what you said. So we're just going to give the award to you. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, so everyone who goes, it's not like the, the Oscars where you go if you're nominated and then there's yeah. this big reveal. Right, it's like yeah. they decide who wins ahead of time and they just mm -hmm. invite the winners at this big dinner banquet. Um, so, yeah, that's what happened. We just got we just got informed that this book we had written for students had had huge impact on mm -hmm. the film special effects industry. And now it's just that's what everyone does. So that was that was a big deal and it you know it made the book do really well and we we actually just published a fourth edition of the book like a week ago it's been many many years in the making a new edition but yeah just came out makes a great gift what's the name of the book uh it is called physically based rendering mm. and it is available where fine books are sold have you made money off of that uh it depends what you mean by money like, people buy the book for money, yeah, yeah. and some of that money goes back to the authors. Yeah. But the market for a graduate-level textbook on computer graphics is pretty small. Mm. Also, you know, like, at some point we made, you know, after the book had been out for a year or so, or two, we made the full text of the book available online. It's so like the third edition of the book has been available on the web for free for a while, as is the source code. Because, you know, our goal was never to make money. Our goal was to advance the state of the art and help people learn. So, uh, yeah, it's like some money has changed hands. But uh, this is not a good retirement plan. Like, I'm not John Grisham. Right? <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not uh, Char the Fellow Michael. Charlotte's Villian. That's right. The, the Michael Crichton of our times. I am not. Hmm. Well, this might be the longest uh, recorded episode. Oh, my gosh. It's 6 in... o'clock setting trick history bart bramley had the previous record i i don't know how long his was <laughs> but uh you uh you have been fantastic thank you yeah this has been really fun i you know you know i like talking about myself so <laughs> it's one of my favorite hobbies <laughs> ask anyone they'll tell you <laughs> i know i like talking about myself too so uh <laughs> um all right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, and we will be publishing this uh, sooner or later than you think. <laughs> Those are the two options, yeah. <laughs>